And thank you all for being here. I'm going to just jump right in because you guys didn't come here to hear me talk. Shmuley, is there an afterlife? We all believe in an afterlife. We just don't believe in some religious people's distortion of the afterlife. One such distortion took place a few blocks away at Ground Zero, where 19 men thought that by practicing violence they would get sex. It's quite an interesting idea. It's about as perverse as, as they come. Muhammad Atta, uh, a note was left by him at Logan Airport where he said, I will soon be with the women of paradise. For him, um, the afterlife is one giant orgy where in recompense for his profound act of violence, he will get celestial orgasmic bliss. Um, for some of my Christian brothers and sisters, the idea of the afterlife is this world as an anteroom for heaven, for a place that's going to be perfect. This is a book written about the afterlife by Dinesh D'Souza, who uh, Christopher and I participated in a debate together in Mexico recently with him. And the introduction is by Rick Warren, one of the country's most respected pastors. He writes, we were made to last forever, and this life is like a warm-up act, a dress rehearsal for the real show in eternity. Once we fully grasp this, it makes all the difference in the world, affecting our choices, values. We reorder our priorities and start emphasizing the enduring important things over the temporary things. So what is the purpose of this world? Only to get into the next world. Hence, religion has come under some very serious and accurate criticism that this world is belittled by faith. That what you do here is nothing but a means to an end. That Jesus is the road to salvation. That we try to garner enough virtue in this world and in this life so that we reach a critical mass. And that critical mass allows you to have the pearly gates of heaven open for you. And if you don't reach that critical mass, well, my friend, like uh, an Oompa Loompa and Charlie, Walk, uh, and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, you get sent straight to the netherworld, but it's not made of chocolate. It is a big, giant barbecue. And you are going to be put on a spit, and you are going to roast forever and ever. Unfortunately, if you're Jewish and you don't believe in Jesus, even if you lived a virtuous life, at times, some of my Christian brothers and sisters would say, if I lived righteously, gave charity, honored my wife, and inspired my children, I am still going to that barbecue. This is the reason why, more than any other belief, the afterlife has undermined religion. St. Peter's Cathedral, where I had the great honor of meeting the Pope four months ago, was built with, with a belief in indulgences, that you could actually buy your way into the afterlife. Some say we have to have an afterlife, because otherwise, how do we explain all the evil in the world? If there's no afterlife, I mean, Hitler can gas a million children. He can, he can turn five million Jews and 90% of the world's Roma gypsy population into lampshades, lampshades, ash, and soap. And he can just put a bullet through his brain and he can escape. Saddam Hussein can just go into a noose. Isn't he roasting somewhere? Come on, my friends. This is also an infantile idea. Do you really believe that no matter what they did to Hitler in some hellish afterlife, if he foundered in purgatory for all eternity, if they put needles into him, if they dismembered him, if they, dis, if they uh, disemboweled him and drew and quartered him, that this would somehow make up for what he did to 12 million innocent non-combatants? Absurd to think that, well, at least he's getting his just reward. That's why, although Judaism absolutely affirms a belief in the afterlife because we believe that there is mind and matter, that there is a conscience, there is a me, call it a soul, an individual will, which is not only conditioned to exist in the temporal confines of the body, but can actually transcend it. In other words, we are an idea and not just a, a living organism. And we believe that that idea can, of course, survive death. Nevertheless, we have a Eden, Judaism is emphatic that the afterlife is right here on earth. The afterlife as a spiritual abode called heaven should be an afterthought. You don't serve God in order to get some big prize in the hereafter. That makes religion into nothing but a petty commercial enterprise. That makes religion into nothing but God, if, you, if I do for you, then you better as heck do for me. And God is an end and not a means. 
The afterlife is right here, and we all believe in it. The Talmud says that the patriarch Jacob did not die. Because the Bible says he didn't die. It says, Vayigva, he was elevated. So the Talmud says, Yaakov Avinu Lomes, our patriarch Jacob never died. And then it says, what do you mean he didn't die? It says he was buried. It says that Pharaoh led a giant procession with Joseph, the viceroy of Egypt, with so many kings who put their crowns on his coffin. He died. And the Talmud says, no. Mazaro Bachaim, Afu Bachaim. Because his children live in the example that he displayed, he has an afterlife through them. I see that with Christopher. I see it with Martin Luther King. I'm a white Jew. But his afterlife impacts me almost every day of my life because he was the greatest American of the 20th century because he restored us to the founding principles of this nation. And every time we want to move away from it, every time someone says something stupid and racist, stupid and, eth and too ethnic, stupid and prejudicial, we remember that he had a dream. And that dream wasn't just while he was a collection of swirling electrons and molecules. That dream transcended him and it lives on in his afterlife. And it impacts upon us until this very day. I am not interested in heaven and I couldn't give a damn about hell. If I'm destined to burn, then so be it. I don't want to be in some perfect place where I have nothing to contribute. In my religion in Judaism, when I go to a cemetery to pray at the graves of great people who represented a great idea so that I'm inspired by their vision, by their dream, by their message, I am obligated to tuck in my tzitzit. I'm obligated to not perform any of the Torah's commandments in their presence. The reason? Because we're not jealous of them in heaven. They're jealous of us on earth. They want to do more good deeds. They want to practice more virtue. A perfect abode in heaven is one of the worst religious ideas, even as I affirm a, affirm a full belief in it. Not that I can prove it. I can't. I cannot. It's a sheer matter of faith. I reject all the silly arguments that are often offered in the name of religion. Near-death experiences, bright lights hovering above your hospital bed. I even saw this cartoon. That said, uh, it showed uh, these surgeons who were operating on someone, and on top there was a giant sign that said, If you can read this, you are dead. <laughs> <laughs> I reject near death experiences. I don't believe they are scientifically uh, acceptable. There's plenty of ways to explain it. So Ouija boards, people who speak to the dead, are all frauds to a man. I debated them on Larry King, all the people who speak to those in the afterlife, Sylvia Brown and, uh, and uh, John Edward and uh, James Von Prague. We were on Larry King, and I said, Larry, this is my yarmulke, and if one of these guys can get up right now and tell us when the next IED will explode in Iraq and Afghanistan, thereby saving the life of a brave American hero, because they can communicate with the dead, where they see the future, I will put salt and pepper on this yarmulke, and I will eat it right here on national TV. <laughs> Not one of them did it, and my yarmulke is still here. The afterlife are the good deeds that we do that live on forever. If we are fortunate and virtuous enough to make our life consecrated, to crystallize our idea through sheer force of will into something larger than ourselves. Something larger than ourselves. For some it's a great act of philanthropy. Dale, uh, um, Andrew Carnegie lives on. I don't have that kind of money. I hope to live on through inspiring my children to bestow dignity on others. That will be my afterlife. Will my soul go to some great abode in the heavens? My religion tells me it will. But I don't care if it doesn't. I was inspired and Christopher said he won't change his convictions because he's not going to allow the netherworld to make him believe. Come on, religion's not supposed to be practiced out of fear. If he changed, people said to me, are you going to convert him? It's going to be great. Can you imagine? The world's greatest atheist. You convert him at the Cooper Union at the Great Hall. And hallelujah, glory be! And I said to them, how pathetic would that be? To discover that a man I've admired and seen as such a formidable opponent was all along a fake and a coward. Who as soon as death stared him in the face, he decided, well, you know, I mean, come on. Like the famous story with Machiavelli. You know, Machiavelli was on his deathbed, this apocryphal story, they say it's true. But the priest says to him, do you renounce Satan and all his works? And Machiavelli ignores him. Do you renounce Satan? And all his works, these are your last moments. Machiavelli opens one eye, turns to the priest and he says, Father, at this stage of my life, it is not wise to make enemies. <laughs> Our afterlife, atheist, religious person, agnostic can all agree, is making our life larger than ourselves. To that extent, some of us won't have one because America has become so narcissistic, so self-centered, 
Facebook, all of this allows us to tell our friends what we ate for breakfast cereal. But those of us who understand it's not about us, it is something larger than us, and that's something that everybody with faith or lack thereof agrees, that it's not about us, then you will have an incredible afterlife. It might be on a global scale, and it might not be. You might be a hero to thousands, you might be a hero only to your own children. But that's how we live on, by living for a cause larger than ourself, to which we dedicate ourselves, and which survives us. If we embraced this idea of an afterlife, it wouldn't have to be an afterthought, and we actually inspire people to see that religion is not born out of weakness and religion is not born out of a hope that we have some sort of immortality because we can't face death, but religion is born out of a genuine desire to make our lives into a blessing for others. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't know, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, hope I can say comrades, friends. Um, if any of you have ever had the experience of pushing hard on an open door and then having it swing <laughs> in on you and fall, not flat on your face, but feel you didn't really need to give it that much of a shove. I thought I came all this way to debate the eschatological questions, the four last things. Death, judgment, heaven and hell. What do I find? Another Jewish secularist. <laughs> And, and another Jewish secularist in the incredibly target-rich environment of Cooper Union on the, Lower East, <laughs> on the Lower East Side of New York. For this, I had to get on the shuttle. <laughs> I take it, I will, I will, uh, I will not take it as um, was once said at the tribute of, um, of uh, virtue to vice, uh, the compliment, the vice based to virtue, the, the idea of hypocrisy in the first place. I take it as the, as the, the, the incremental effort of a lot of steady work that some of us have been putting in to dispel illusions in the supernatural. And in a private belief that I've held for a long time, which is that very many of the practitioners of these faiths don't believe it either. And perhaps that might be the first consolation uh, that we take away from this evening's discussion. My own task having been so much lightened, even though I retain the tiny suspicion, and I hope it's an ignoble one, um, that. Rabbi Shmuley might, might possibly be going easy on me. <laughs> and that would be a great cause of resentment. Uh, if I thought for a second that that was true, it's already bad enough that I'm the fifth person appearing on this stage, and you may have noticed the steady decline in the standard of pulchritude uh, that went on uh, after number three had left the stage. Um, so I'm, I'm left to restate what I still want to say and have to begin with a disagreement. The idea that a person who martyrs himself and kills others in the cause of the faith will be rewarded in paradise is not a delusion of Muhammad Atta's. I, I wish it was. It would be very nice if we could say that that was the case. It is rather um, a belief firmly rooted in the holy book of the Muslim faith, the Quran. It is believed by an enormous number of people. It may not be disbelieved that someone who martyrs himself for the faith will be so rewarded. To do that would be to challenge the authenticity of the book, and therefore cannot be done. The most that can be done is to say that somebody interpreted this mad instruction incorrectly. But we would be living in a very happy world indeed if this was just a delusion of one leader of a 19-man gang. The same, I think, can be said of I think it's, I, you'll correct me, I'm sure, surely, if I'm mistaken, but I think it's number 13 of the Rambam's uh, list of uh, articles of faith. Um, Maimonides' uh, uh, opinions the, the, of what it's necessary to believe in order to be of the faithful, uh, that there will be a resurrection. Uh, it comes just after, I think, the belief that the Messiah will come. Though, because it's Maimonides, because it's the Rambam, he does say, Ah, though he may tarry, you may not doubt that he will come, nor may you doubt that you're due another life. Now, I'm sorry. I take this stuff very seriously because I have to deal with, as I do with the Christian version of it, put so creepily and so shadily that we bury our dead, the Christian faith, uh, which I'm not a member, they bury their dead in what they call, in this slightly evasive way, the sure and certain hope of resurrection. Not the sureness and the certainty of, you notice. They, 
They haven't got the arrogance for that anymore, but the sure and certain hope, and certain hope of resurrection. These are the beliefs on which monotheism has based itself and on, upon which it continues to exert its extraordinary and lethal power. And I won't, I, I won't take your offer. Uh, Rabbi, I can't take it. I can't say all they're talking about is posthumous fame. All they're talking about is reputation. After all, people still read Shakespeare. Surely that proves that there's an afterlife. No, I'm sorry. It's, it's a confusion of categories. It's not comparing like with like. It's not even non-overlapping magisterial. It's, it's radically discrepant views of what reality is. And if, if religion would say, we don't promise you anything after death, that would be the end of it. And Shmuley would be talking ethical Judaism, and I would be saying, ah, atheism is compatible with any belief you like. You can be an atheist and be a supporter of Ayn Rand, the most famous atheist in America. You can be an atheist and a nihilist. You can be an atheist and a fascist. All you have to do is say that you reject the supernatural dimension. But that's the most crucial thing. And now, the critique of religion that we've evolved over the years in Mortal Kombat with it is this, essentially. First, that it has a very queasy relationship with anything called evidence. That it makes very, very large claims for itself. Perhaps Rabbi Shmuley won't choose this evening to do so, but it claims to talk in terms of redemption of salvation, and even of eternity, and there's an inverse relationship between what it claims and the amount of evidence that it can muster, and that this is its original, if you like, uh, sin. Uh, second, that it seems to deal in absolutes, that it appears to want us to think of a God who is in some way or another a dictator in this world, and if this one should prove disappointing, I think you used the word dress rehearsal, the term dress rehearsal, a mere ante room, if you think this is unfair, <coughs> If you think this is discrepant, if you think this is irrational, why do the evil prosper? Why do the good get trampled underfoot and left behind? Never mind. Once you've squeezed with agony, agony through the keyhole of death, there's another whole world where all that will be put right. Where every tear will be dried and every injustice compensated which if it was true would be a terrible exercise in sadomasochism. Why put a bunch of rats into a labyrinth of torture, see how they do, surprise them with new rules, even bigger surprise when you squeeze them through that last gap. Ah! Now we have you and now you're due for a verdict against which there is no appeal. If you don't believe in that as a scheme, you don't believe in God, you don't believe in the biblical promise of redemption and salvation, and you certainly don't believe in the resurrection. So, I think Shmuley's word on that is uh, that that's the case is as good as anyone else's, and I'd say perhaps better than some. But I'm talking also to people who will be tuning into this broadcast later, and I have a captive audience, and so <laughs> I've got a couple more points to make before I rest the case that you smoothed for me. Um, <laughs> That it's based on, this, another element in our critique of it, is that it's based on wishful as well as delusional thinking. Above all, wishful thinking. What is a stronger desire in the human species than that we shall conquer death? We are the only primates, as far as we know, we're the only members even of our own species, the primate species, who are fully aware of death and absolutely unreconciled to the idea of our own extinction. Even though we know our chemical composition, we know we are made out of the same elements as the rest of the cosmos. In fact, rather miraculously, if you want to call it that, we're even made out of stardust. Stars had to die for us to live. So we think it's overwhelmingly probable that when we die, our chemical ingredients will return to the, the natural biological and biochemical cycle, and there seems no evidence to the contrary. There may be animals uh, who know how to fear death, but certainly no animals who know how to deny it. That's why it's so interesting that among the most frequently asked questions of people to their priests and mullahs and rabbis about the afterlife is, will my dog or cat be there too? Um, and you notice they only ask that, will Timmy be in heaven or rover? They never say, will that hellish tabby I once had um, be reassembled in the infernal regions? This is enough to show how wishful the thinking is. Now I see that really has Dinesh's um, clever but I think thin book on the case for the afterlife in front of him. And in, in one debate that I had with Dinesh, 
he, he briefly gave me pause by saying, yes, wishful thinking for heaven, all right. That's hedonistic. That's a hope. That's a desire. But then why would people who were wish thinking, why would they want hell? Good point, and it, it's, and it, it tells against simple-minded Freudianism, uh, as does a lot of other evidence. But not all of our wishes are completely transparent to us, I think, and not all of them are hedonistic, especially as they respect or regard other people. I was one of the two or three white people in the audience at Madison Square Garden in 1985 when Louis Farrakhan gave his famous address to a packed house of the Nation of Islam and addressed the Jews of, of the greater New York, New York area in a taunting manner and reminded them, and I'll never forget it, he said, uh, and remember Jews, when God puts you in the ovens, it's forever. And I shall not soon forget the great moan and groan of pleasure that came from that audience at hearing that. And I should have been prepared for it, not just by the stupidity and nastiness and criminality on which this religious nutbag makes his living in this country. Call someone an imam or a priest or a reverend, there's nothing they can't get away with in our culture. <laughs> If I could change one thing, it would be that. The second would be when someone gets up and says, I'm a person of faith, that you, they don't get respect for it. They, expect, they think that's a respect-producing statement. I am a person of faith. You know, I'm a person who will believe practically anything or no evidence at all. <laughs> well, you said it, mister. Respect comes later. Um, I digress. I shouldn't have been surprised by this orgy of sadism and cruelty and gloating from Farrakhan's religious audience because I've read the Christian fathers. I've read Tertullian, who, answering some questions, one of the great fathers of the church, we see why hell is unpleasant. Why is heaven such fun? It seems to be rather dutiful. Endless praise, endless worship, endless subjection, uh, endless tedium. Uh, you think that the Lord himself, after the first five billion years, would have had enough of the songs of praise. No, it's got to go on forever. <laughs> okay, where's the good bits? Tertullian says that we've thought of the good bits. In the intervals of that, you can go to the edge and you can go and look down and gloat on the torments and endless tortures of the damned. We've thought of that. Now, excuse me, that is a founding statement of Christianity. You can't disown it now. These churches wouldn't be here oppressing us. These mosques wouldn't be here incubating madmen and suicide bombers. There wouldn't be mad Jewish settlers on the West Bank thinking if we could only steal other people's land and bring on the Messiah and Armageddon, everything would be all right. There wouldn't, there wouldn't be anything of this if it was left to the rabbi, if it was left to the rabbi and myself, but it's not. And the, his, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, who's, His Holiness the Pope, has just got off the plane in England today to announce that atheists are Nazis. <laughs> an overdressed little ponce who was himself a member of the Hitler Youth <laughs> dares to speak this way he leaves, he leaves the palace that quite rightly quite rightly Shmuley points out was built on the sale of indulgences well picture the church as if it had not done that are you talking about the same formidable multinational force no you're not have they disowned what they did no they haven't are they not still chantries all around the world where prayers are paid for and said for the souls of the dead, so that there may be remission from sin, measured, by the way, in years and decades. Or, if you've paid a lot of money to a chantry, maybe centuries of remission from sin, as if the Gregorian calendar is used for matters of eternity and infinity. The pathos, the obviousness of this fraud still goes on, and Ratzinger himself is, is reinstituting the idea that by making donations to the church and regular appearances at its festivals, there may be an element of remission too. And only now is it being discussed that St. Augustine's vile idea that the souls of unbaptized children may not go to hell but go to an indefinite misery of limbo until the second coming uh, may possibly not have been the way, quite the tone of voice in which to speak to parents who'd lost their child. I'm not neutral about this. I don't think those statements are what they clearly are, man-made. Silly, pathetic, mediocre, and erroneous. That is a job within the compass of anyone 
in this room or beyond. No, I say, I say, I go further. It's an evil doctrine. It's a wicked doctrine. It proceeds from people who want, quite wisely and quite shrewdly, real power over real human beings of a really absolutist sort in the only world we've got, which is the here and now. How smart they are to do it, how overdue we are to tell them that we reject this totalitarian interpretation of human life. Well, I'm not going to say why I don't think non near-death experiences are impressive now. So you've spared me that, thank you. <laughs> Although I wish someone would ask about them. <laughs> um, <coughs> and I think, excuse me, <coughs> I think I've probably trespassed anyway on the allotted uh, period of my time. But what I say is, thanks for coming, and bring it on, and don't make me suspect that you're sparing me. Thank you. <laughs>
to be the Jewish Forrest Gump. Um, <laughs> They're all going to talk about peace, and we're all going to believe that we all going to believe that we could somehow settle global conflicts through protracted negotiation and diplomacy when we know it's never been done. It probably will never be done, and we do so without any evidence because we believe in the triumph of peace. That is Jewish messianism. The Jews were the first to speak of great men not slaughtering each other with swords but beating their swords into plowshares. This goes back 2,500 years. So when we take religion, we say it's always about violence. And religion is always about, about saying that you're not saved. That wasn't the Hebrew prophets. They weren't perfect. And Christopher will be able to bring many examples where the Bible commanded things that are, to me as a man of faith, utterly inexplicable. And it's very painful to try to understand these things. And we've addressed these in other debates, or I've tried my best to address them. But to say that atheism is a panacea for all of this, and it's, and it's perfect, come on. Uh, it's a different debate, I don't want to go into it. But we all know that secular atheistic utopias killed more people in the 20th century than all the ro world's religions combined. Okay, uh, Mao killed 30 million, Stalin, I'm sorry, Mao killed probably 40 to 50 million, Stalin about 30 million, Hitler 12 million, Pol Pot 3.5 million. Excuse me, I could, okay, whatever, I could go on. Now, Hitler, now, 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 Christopher says in his book, yes, but it wasn't done in the name of atheism. That doesn't make a difference, because Hitler sort of thought that he could say who should live and who should die. Quite literally, they would sit there with a finger and they would point. And a religious person would say that should be reserved to God. Do the, are there those who abuse religion? Of course! What I've learned from my debates with Christopher is this. Believe it or not, and I will say something that I know is on the record, and I am not a Jewish secularist. I am a profoundly and proudly orthodox Jew who prays three times a day, eats kosher food, will fast on Yom Kippur. But I will not embrace, nor will I preach, a false idea of religion that has done so much harm to religion. I state here emphatically, without any fear of refutation, that my Islamic brothers and sisters serve the one true God, and they are my brothers. That my Christian brothers and sisters serve the one true God, and they are my brothers. That Christopher Hitchens, who doesn't believe in any God, works for humanity, points out hypocrisy on the part of those who deserve to hear it. Religion needs strong critics, and he serves the cause of humanity, which for me is sort of the same thing, because I think God loves his children more than he cares about himself. And the very first rule of the Bible, Leviticus 19, is to love your fellow man as yourself. What does Maimonides say about the afterlife? He says that, that there will be a resurrection, and then everyone will die. Interestingly, he's the only one that says it among the Jewish sages, and we will live in all eternity after the Messiah comes, uh, in a disembodied state in heaven. Nachmanides disagrees with him, Christopher. He says that when you die, yes, there is an abode of souls, because there is a soul. But Nachmanides says, Rabbi Moses ben Nachman, that although there's a abode where the eternity of the soul experiences the bliss of being in the divine presence, ultimately those souls will be, as you said, resurrected in bodies because it is only this world that matters. It is the justice, the righteousness, and good deeds in this world that matters. You don't have to accept that. If you're a person of faith, you're going to believe it as an article of faith. Einstein didn't like that chaos. Einstein wanted what Christopher wants. This world which seems to be ordered purely by reason. But it turns out that Einstein embarrassed himself in the last decades of his life because he rejected the truth of quantum physics. He, looked, he searched for a unified field theory, really began to undermine his scientific credentials, never really contributed to science after the age of 25, because he couldn't accept that the world was chaos, complete and utter chaos, that it couldn't even be measured, that it, didn't even, it wasn't even subject to the rules of mathematics. I try to bring reason to the world, but I am humble enough to admit when I don't know, or when things transcend knowledge. Never once in my debates with Christopher Hitchens have I ever said, this is so because the Bible says so, or this is so because I believe it. When we debated God, whether I did a good job or a bad job, my argument was that based on my limited understanding and having reviewed as much of the scientific literature that I can, because I absolutely believe in science, it does not seem to me that mathematically there is a strong probability that life could have evolved of its own accord. And I've looked at the math, and it, that, I still retain that attention. I've looked at the anthropic principle, so many other things that seem to sh show that the world has a unique precision that would defy um, an accident. When I debated Christopher on whether we need God to be good, I believe that unless you have some divine authority that says it's always wrong to murder, human beings will always find a reason to murder, including religious people who will use whatever they find in religion to justify their own reasons for murder. But I'm not going to murder. I disagree with Christopher's opinion about 
settlers being the cause of Middle Eastern conflict. I believe in the Middle East, it's my opinion, that right now it's Hamas and Hezbollah, funded by Iran. And I know many settlers, but let me tell you, and many settlers, and the vast majority of the settlers that I know are people who just want to live in peace. And yes, they believe, not, not just in the divine nature of the land, although there are those who absolutely believe in that, but mostly they believe that they've tried peace, it hasn't worked, so now Israel has to hunker down and just control strategic points. Many of, those, many of them are there for that reason. Many of them are secular, by the way. But let me just tell you, when Baruch Goldstein killed 29 Arabs, the, on Purim Day, the happiest, most celebratory day of the Jewish calendar, my house was firebombed that night. It was a uh, Spanish au pair that saved my children's lives. I said that day that Baruch Goldstein, some Jews, some a tiny minority excused what he did. They said, the guy snapped. You know, he was treating so many of his friends who were stabbed to death. You can't blame him. He used to treat Arabs too, and he did. But he snapped. And the others said, no, no, he actually had intelligence that the Arabs of Hebron were going to attack the settlements. So he preempted their murder by striking a blow, you know, the doctrine of preemption. I got up in front of national TV after my house was firebombed and I said, Baruch Goldstein, I'll say it right now, although it'll disappoint some Jews, and I've been criticized for it heavily, strongly. Baruch Goldstein is a cold-blooded killer, an abomination to Judaism. There is never an excuse to kill someone who is innocent, ever. The only excuse to kill is in self-defense, period. If someone wants to take your life. These were 29 innocent people who just wanted to pray. I say that on what? Based on the religious authority of God saying, do not kill. And when my Palestinian brothers and sisters turn to me and say, but come on, Shmuley, we have to do suicide bombings because we don't have helicopter, helicopter gunships. We have to strike back because there's all, all these Israeli checkpoints. Okay, I hear you. But let me just tell you, your religion also says do not murder. Ever. Even when you have checkpoints. The Jews were subjected to, let me use the classic British understatement, the Jews had a rough time in Nazi Germany. But they never blew up nurseries. They didn't resort to blowing up buses. They never used that as an excuse to punish innocent children. And I say that to my Arab brothers and sisters, based on the religious authority that you cannot kill. Religion does have an application, but I gotta tell you, so does atheism. I wrote an article about, about Christopher's illness, I told the story of Rabbi Zusha of Anapoli that he told his students, one of the greatest Hasidic masters, he said, atheism is necessary for faith. And they were about to tear their clothing. They heard blasphemy. Atheism is necessary for faith? He said to them, every time you see someone who's hungry, someone who's naked, who needs clothing, your first reaction as a religious person is, there's a God he'll provide. You're supposed to doubt it sometimes. What if there is no God? What if I am the one who must stand in God's stead? We need intelligent critics of religion. My whole problem with Christopher Hitchens has simply been this that he finds no redeeming qualities of religion at all. You can criticize the Catholic Church. What happened to the pedophile PLA scandals are disgusting, abominable. But are you gonna criticize an organization that runs the largest network of orphanages, hospitals, and schools in the entire world? Are you gonna say it's all bad? You can criticize religion. Are you gonna say it didn't inspire Martin Luther King's message of racial harmony? He never had any title except reverend throughout his entire life, period. Every speech he gave was quoting from the Hebrew prophets who spoke of a time when human beings would live together as one people with one tongue, sharing one hope. That wasn't an atheistic vision. That came two and a half thousand years ago, as I said, from the Hebrew prophets. So my issue with Christopher is not that he has very legitimate criticisms of religion that I myself would, art would articulate. Because I don't believe in perfection. I believe in struggle. I said it before. It's why Eden and paradise have no appeal to me. I want a place where I wrestle with my conscience to try to do the right thing. Heroism is found specifically when there's two sides and you have to triumph, one over the other. Especially not slaying dragons outside of you, but the demons that live inside you. But to say it's all bad is like coming along and saying that all atheists are terrible and they only poison. And that was said by religion for thousands of years, that kind of religious hypocrisy. So no, I am not a secularist at all. And yes, I absolutely affirm a belief and I have no evidence and I say it openly because I'm not a liar. There's no evidence, even, even Dinesh D'Souza's argument, which is interesting, he said it in our debate in Puebla, that, nine, that uh, uh, physicists now admit that 95% of the universe is dark matter. We don't even know what it is. Maybe that's heaven. Well, maybe it is, but that's still not evidence. Some people say there's, when you believe, many scientists who are atheists believe in extraterrestrial life. Why do they believe in it? Christopher said that science is about hard evidence. We don't have the most, a scintilla of evidence that there's any life 
on other planets. Nothing, zero. And yet we spend billions with uh, radio satellites and probes looking for this thing. And there isn't a scintilla of evidence. You may as well look for heaven. It's the same thing. In fact, more people probably believe in heaven. But again, I accept his argument about evidence. I believe in an afterlife, the way the relig religion describes it. I believe in paradise. I believe in all those things because I'm religious. And it's, it's the foundation of my life, these beliefs. And yes, they don't only lend themselves. And they're easily ridiculed. I agree. But there are many things in life that do not lend themselves to evidence. But, that's not, that's, but that, what, what I'm saying is, none of this is ever emphasized in my faith. None of it. Jews almost never discuss the afterlife. This world, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, giving hope to the hopeless. That's why religion, Judaism is such a this world grounded religion. We actually say that this world is the one that matters. There's nothing secular about it. So your vision of religion is not the one that I buy into. But thank you very much. Sorry I went on. I think that um, having, so to speak, invented the toxin of mon monotheism, it's a wonderful thing that Jews have been the greatest contributors to undoing it. Um, <laughs> by means of discovery in every possible field of endeavor, beginning with the great first Baruch, and then when he changed his name, Benedict Spinoza, who was the, the first one to see through the idea of a creator God, a personal God, one who answered prayers, one who made special covenants with different tribes, and all this and other um, delusion, and for his pains was very, very horribly expelled and bullied out of his synagogue in Amsterdam and pelted around Europe by all the Christian powers who for once agreed with what the leaders of a synagogue had done by way of putting an end to free thinking. And we still don't know whether we have as much as half of what Spinoza actually wrote, a lot of which had to be in code. But from that great tradition, which, which t picks up from that of Lucretius and Epicurus and Galileo, um, to move on to Marx, Freud, um, Einstein, and others, is to have, yes, done a, done a, a, a tremendous work of the mind against superstition. And yes, it's true, and I'll, I will I'll concede this to you. Of the three monotheisms, Judaism makes the least up of the afterlife. I mean, there are two words for hell that we have, um, Sheol and Gehenna, I think, are at least two, that are Jewish religious words. But they, there's a great deal of argument about what you need to do to get there, and uh, whether you're in the same chemical composition as you were when you were who you said you were. And yes, I'll give you this too. Jews in some way look forward, I would not say it's completely in the material world, they look forward to supernatural events in the material world, such as the little child leading the predator, or um, in some versions, the lion lying down with the lamb. We remember Woody Allen says, well, maybe the lion will lie down with the lamb, but the, the lamb won't get much sleep. <laughs> In other words, it's, it's, it's still expecting supernatural results in the natural world, which to me qualifies as religious. Of course, there could be an afterlife and no God. That's quite possible. There could be a devil and no God while we're inventing supernatural entities. There could be a hell and no heaven. That's all quite possible. There could be a God and none of these. They're all contingent. Why? Because they're all so obviously man-made. Now, in that, I don't see, granted this, what is meaningful in the statement that one is religious anymore. Um, to say a couple of words, mildly, in defense of the Marxist conception of history, at least, well, it grounds itself on the idea that there is no supernatural dimension, that the material world is sufficient explanation for people's motives. And as Marx writes very brilliantly in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, um, Religion is the sigh of the, the, sigh of the oppressed uh, creature, uh, the spirit of the spiritless situation, the heart of the heartless world. And criticism of it has, as he says, uh, plucked the flowers from the chain, not in order that we shall wear the chain without consolation, but in order that we may break the chain and cull the living flower. And yes, to that extent, I'm willing to defend that conception of history and and philosophy. Now, it's a, this doesn't mean materialism sounds bleak, or, or may be made to sound bleak and arid and reductionist. It doesn't mean there's no room in our conception for the numinous or the transcendent.
if you wish, or the ecstatic for what's experienced in music, love, landscape, solidarity, other, I think, human and natural phenomena. Um, if, I'm asked, if I'm asked to describe what I think has happened to a child whose body has been maimed by a priest and whose psyche has been and sexuality has been destroyed at the age of five, as, say, the recent Belgian bishop's nephew had to undergo, the Pope only protesting when the police took an interest in the matter, which doesn't make it, by the way, an exception. It makes it the rule. But I could have picked another example. I say, if I was asked what's happened to this kid, I'd say his soul has been destroyed. I wouldn't say, it, I wouldn't say that with any embarrassment at all. I would need an extra word. It would be not enough to say this kid has been abused. Right? This is pathetic. Our language, our secular language, our journalistic language is in grave danger, I think, of becoming morally emaciated. Abuse for, for rape and torture and the prolonged destruction of the possibility of, an, of, a, of a full personality. No, you need more than that. It's, the Germans have a word for it. Soul murder. It's a good, it's a good expression. You wouldn't want to be without it. And I would, I would affirm that genuinely, I, just as I find that the word evil is absolutely necessary. You mentioned my work, uh, thank you, on Saddam Hussein and others. I feel I've even smelled it, the, the, the sense of evil that you get with racism and genocide and sadism, what I've described in, the, in my materialist note as the surplus value of dictatorship an evil and cruel dictatorship that wants evil and cruelty not for its own interest or because it would serve its turn or kill its enemies. That's too easy to explain. No, likes these things for their own sake. Will do them even if it risks the stability and reputation and profitability of the regime. Needs it. Needs cruelty. Needs murder. Needs the real authentic stench of evil that I claim to have felt in my own nostrils. I think any account of fascism that, is, that lacks that is, again, morally thin and historically emaciated too. By the way, if you ever want a liberal who doubts this, get him to say the word evil. Do you know how to do it? You can. Just put the word lesser in front of it and they'll vote for it. <laughs> they know. They know. It's just they don't like to admit it. So, materialism needn't be uh, reductionism. But we mustn't inflate the religious uh, claim either. Um, let's take three. I'll, I'll just take three, and then I, I think we ought to turn it over of, of uh, Shmuley's um, cr critiques. I'll start with Dr. King. Um, actually, he had a better title in front of his name than Reverend, which was Doctor, but never mind. That's a quibble. When he cited the Hebrew prophets, which he did all the time, because there was really only one way of getting an audience in the South without being immediately killed, and that was to claim that you were speaking in the name of the Christian God of the slavers, <laughs> who'd invented the problem in the first place, so you better know your testament, boy. <laughs> That's the only licensed form of criticism there was in the epoch of racist uh, dictatorship. And he knew the books, sure he knew the books, and my friend Taylor Branch, in his wonderful biography of him, gives the books their, if you like, his, the, the, the volumes, their right names, The Pillar of Fire, The Parting of the Waters. Yes, he knew the Exodus story. Aren't we glad he didn't mean it? He would have been saying his tribe was entitled to kill anyone else who got in their way. The Amalekites, the Midianites, away with them. Kill them. Kill their children. Take their women. Steal their land. You have God on your side and justice too. Aren't we really glad? that Dr. King, who studied Hegel at university and did his uh, real work on secular studies, aren't we glad that he knew this stuff was metaphorical at best and toxic even then? And even then he's in a joust with the people who say the slogan of the Confederacy, Deo Vindice, God is on our side. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. We lose something from our history. And I will say this on the platform, the podium of the great... Abraham Lincoln, it's a good place to say it. A man who was a determined, an absolutely determined non-believer and satir satirist and ridiculer of religion and the first to point out that both sides in this terrible oncoming war claimed that God favored them. Who now remembers, look what we've lost in our culture and our discussion of, of the struggle against racism. 
Who in school, I ask you who are parents, who in school is taught the name of Bayard Rustin? The great American socialist and social democrat and originator and organizer of the March on Washington. Name to, and original gay activist and persecuted and framed by the FBI for that too. Forgotten, forgotten. Who knows the name of A. Philip Randolph? The great organizer of black American labor. Uh, a, a wonderful trade unionist and politician who organized a march on Washington for equal rights when Franklin Roosevelt was president, long before Dr. King had even been born. Obliterated from our story and our culture because we don't have reverend in front of the name. And if you want to pose as ethical, do like Sharpton does. Get called the reverend now. <laughs> then there's nothing you can't do or say. No, no pose you may not strike. This is not encouraging. Um, now, last, and I, I think dolorously, but inevitably, because it never doesn't come up. Um, I'm not a member of a faction that goes out and shoots people and burns their churches and burns their books if I feel offended. I hope that's clear. Um, if it isn't clear, I feel I'd better give you the reassurance now. You can say what you like about Marx and Darwin and Einstein, and burn their books. You know, I won't care, and I won't come burn your church or your house. And I don't get appeased by the Joint Chiefs of Staff or the Head of Central Intelligence or the President either, as if I might. But I don't want that kind of respect, thanks. Only the religious and the faithful seem entitled to demand that. But I do mind being insulted, all the same. I have a certain residue of self-respect, which, uh, though it won't survive me, means a little to me now. And religious people are often unaware of it. They'll say things fantastically rude on first meeting, like, oh, you don't believe in God? Where do you get your ideas of right and wrong from? <laughs> what? <laughs> the Pope says at the intaking of the capital city of the, the, of the Albigensians, a Christian heresy, Simon de Montfort, his general, said, you want, you want me to kill them all? How will I know who's an Albigensian? So kill them all. God will know his own. The Hamas people interviewed in Gaza recently by the Palestinian correspondent, a very brave woman, the New York Times, said, what do you mean you're shooting people in the hospital? Says to this, this, this uh, humanoid. Says, we're doing them a favor. If they're good Muslims, they'll already be in paradise. These people want to know how I get my ideas of morality without a belief in the, in the totalitarian power of the supernatural. I object. I don't like being talked to in that tone of voice. And, and I hold it down. And then I get told that um, atheism is Nazism. The Pope does it today, getting off the fucking plane in Edinburgh to talk to the Queen. And Shmuley doesn't exactly not say it. Now, on this, because of the totalitarians of the 20th century, Adolf Hitler is the only one he mentioned more than twice. I'll, because, and because I can't do them all, though, believe me, I will if you press me. I'll just take the Führer. My former colleagues and ancestors at the New School produced a very comprehensive edition of Mein Kampf, the hard book to get. They wanted, it, they wanted everyone to read it, and I have several copies of the edition they brought out in 1940, just slightly too late, actually, in the hope of warning people. <coughs> I think it's the, at the closing pages of chapter 2, Adolf Hitler says that his work, his work against the Jews is done on the direct instruction and inspiration of Almighty God. Uh, it's certainly a trope that's repeated throughout the book. If you, and there was no reason for someone brought up in Catholic Austria, Bavaria, not to think that. Centuries of Christian instruction in the poisonous nature of, uh, of the Jewish people, the verminous character of the Jewish people. An uncontroversial remark. The Vatican at that point was willing to ban books by Evelyn Waugh and Graham Greene say nothing, books about evolution and the Big Bang. They were invited to ban Mein Kampf, did they? No, they didn't. Instead, the Vatican made its first ever political treaty with, uh, with the Third Reich, exchanging complete control over education on their part for complete control over the rest of the state by the Nazi party. What did it say on the belt buckle of every single member of the Nazi army? What did it say? Gott mit uns. Do you want me to translate? It says God on our side, in German. If you took your oath to the Fuhrer, how did it have to begin? I swear in the name of Almighty God, my undying fealty to Adolf Hitler. Shmuley, I won't take it from you. I'm sorry. I don't want to spoil a relatively friendly evening either. Don't you dare bring this up again. 
I can take a lot. Read any history of fascism in the 20th century and take out the word fascist from any history that's remotely objective, including much written by Christian historians, and just put in, instead of the word fascist, extreme Catholic. You don't need to change another word. To say this was secular is just getting history completely wrong. To say it's atheist is a deliberate, conscious insult, and I won't have it. So, now you know how rude I can be. Soul death and the destruction of the soul. The soul, yes. And, and what is, for you, what is the soul? It would be like saying, it's like reducing love to sex, if you wish. Um, you can do it. I mean, we've all tried. Often, <laughs> I mean, often after being, shall we say, disappointed in love, I say, why, should, why did she, if it was a she, um, <laughs> Why did she give me such a... What is she up with? A rag, a bone, a hank of hair, a bunch of hormones? What the hell? What was, it, what was all that about? Yeah, but you keep telling yourself, keep asking yourself, you won't come up with the, with the answer. This is, I'm just putting it anecdotally. If you, if you took out the word soul, if you took out the word evil, if you took out the word spirit, Marx can't, Marx can't discuss religion without saying it's the spirit of a spiritless situation. If you describe an event or a, or a city as soulless, everyone knows what you mean. It's somehow um, necessary. We couldn't. All, all I can say, that's, as with the word numinous, is that it's the it's the it's the penumbra. It's what you can't quite see, but we can't do without it. Especially since, which I should have said earlier, I mean, the great the great delight of being alive now is that we do know, though we know less and less. We know less and less about more and more, at least. And we are on the verge of extraordinary discoveries, both about our own nature and interior, from the genome and other things, and about the cosmos. And we, but we know incredibly little about galaxy formation, about how many universes there might be. Um, about the, the, there are people like my, my friend and colleague in the atheist movement, Sam Harris, a great neurologist, who think the NDE, near-death experience stuff, may be, all, may be all nonsense, not unlike spiritualism, but the possibility of consciousness, in some sense independent of the physical brain, is worth examining, and there's work being done in it. I'm, if he's interested in that, then so am I. So if, um, if that were possible, then you, that would be something that would live on past the body? Um, well, the, I think there would need to be bodies still around to, so to speak, transmit it. I don't think it's going to, it's not going to, it's not going to be in um, a stratosphere, or it's not the word I'm looking for. Stratosphere. Um, uh, it's not going to be in some astral plane that these things are resolved. Uh, one will need to have minds made of meat in order to process them, print them. Uh, there have to be events like this where they can be debated. Um, but yes, there will, there, there will be. We live on the verge of extraordinary discoveries. So, so you would. But I don't think they will lead to a supernatural. It will not lead to our discovering a supernatural plane of which we were hitherto unaware. But if it's not something within nature and if it's not something material, it would by definition be supernatural. Maybe not religious, but it would be supernatural. Well, the religious people have tended in the past, because they, look, here's the great contradiction of being religious. And she really is exemplified in a very amiable way this evening. If you, if you are a person of faith, then that's what you are a person of especially in Christianity and Islam, it's the strength of your faith that is, is your merit. It's your willingness to believe and to risk your life for it, no matter what. Do you affirm it? Yes, I do. Um, how does it go? They say it five times a day. There is no God but God, and Allah is his messenger. You notice the first four words are exactly right. Muhammad is his messenger. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, and Muhammad. There is no God but God, and, and Muhammad is his messenger. The first four words are exactly right. There is no God. So five times a day, millions of people around the world unknowingly speak four words of complete truth. <laughs> Progress of a kind. But it's the faith that is the merit. What do they want evidence for? They're never going to get any evidence for that. The merit is the faith. So as soon as they say, ah, and by the way, 
it is possible to make night journeys to Jerusalem on a horse. The faith shrivels. It shrivels. And, the, and Christianity has given itself away repeatedly on this. It now says, ah, we didn't used to think there was a big bang, but, but now we realize there was one. reads a lot like Genesis when you read it backwards. <laughs> Plagiarism, pure and simple. They do it all the time. And then the, now, they're, now they're pimping off the back of medical science and doing extraordinary moments in, in surgery and surgical intervention to do the near-death experience racket. This is a familiar thing. All these things will yield to properly controlled scientific investigation. But the things that we know already are miraculous enough. Science is not infallible either. No. My husband, when he started medical school, the first day they said, his professor stood in front of him and he said, I just want you to know that everything you learn these four years, by the time you finish your practice, half of it will be proven untrue. The problem is you just don't know which half. Surely. Can I just, okay, you want to put a question? Or? Yeah, you know, it's worth uh, addressing some of the points that, that uh, Christopher made. You know, s many here, I'm sure, are familiar with the story. Socrates was told by the oracle at Delphi that he was the wisest man in Greece. And when he heard it, he chuckled and he said, if that is so, it is because I am the only one who knows what he doesn't know. And I think there used to be a certain humility to scientific investigation where theories were postulated to explain evidence, to explain facts. That is the scientific method. And we all know that it works. It works in medicine. It works with your iPhone. It works with all your appliances. And there's great truth to science. There's an arrogance that's developing in science that I think should be a little bit worrisome. Because what I said in that debate with Dawkins is, Maimonides, considered the greatest Jewish thinker of all time, who was uh, strongly influenced by Aristotle, and, by, and he was a great doctor, of course, uh, court physician to, to Sultan uh, Salah al-Din, Saladin. He said, Kabbalah emes mimisha omru, you must embrace the truth regardless of its source. And Judaism, I can't speak for other religions, but Judaism is a religion based on this search for truth. Now, Lisa just said that Science does change its theories, and sometimes with, with great frequency. When Maimonides was alive, the most important scientific theory of the time was the Aristotelian theory of the eternity of matter. It sort of survived into modern science and the solid state theory. There was no belief that matter actually came into existence. And because of that, many Jews of the time wanted to reinterpret the book of Genesis to accommodate this eternity of matter. Maimonides said, I would do it if the facts could be proven by some infallible means to be true, but I believe the theory is flawed and he subjected it to a scientific refutation in his great philosophical treatise uh, written 900 years ago, The Guide to the Perplexed. Of course later, and now Christopher is saying that, that religion uh, is uh, plagiarizing science, um, we came up with the Big Bang Theory after the solid state theory, where all of existence, the entire universe came into existence in an instant. Now, is that the story of Genesis? I don't know. There are similarities. It's impressive that there are some similarities. I'm sure there are many discrepancies as well. But to say that we plagiarize it, come on. The entire ancient world believed in the eternity of matter. Um, other religions advocated the seven days and seven nights of Krishna, that, every, that life was cyclical. Even, you know, that famous book, The Gifts of the Jews, points out that the one thing that the Jews definitely gave the world that, was, that could not have been plagiarized because it was so original was the idea of linear history as opposed to cyclical history. And of course, our calendar now is based entirely on linear history. There are many gifts of religion. To deny them all, I think, is to, to deny the facts. Cardinal Walter Casper was very controversial today. I haven't even seen the whole story, but he said, he's in charge of the Catholic Church's interfaith relations. He said that Britain was a third world country. He should not offend other nations, and he was rightly left off the, the Pope's trip as a result. But I had a meeting with Cardinal Casper about four months ago at the Vatican. He seemed to me a man of humility and a man of openness, very soft-spoken. Um, I wonder how he got to be a cardinal. I'm sorry? I wonder how he got to be a cardinal with all those qualities. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, he and the Pope grew up in Germany together? I don't know. But he was, uh, gave us a lot of time. Um, but he said that Britain is beginning to show evidence of a certain virulent kind of atheism. You know, it's funny because I, I had a front row seat to this development. I started doing, and, my, and in my arrogance I might even legitimately claim, to be one of the sources of origin for this modern um, sequence of publishing events about great books on atheism. And the, I'll tell you why. 
because Richard Dawkins, and he will verify this story, was known to sort of not believe in God. He wasn't very outspoken against religion. Um, and I asked him uh, to do a debate on science versus religion. And we did this massive debate. And then we started doing them every single year. I think we had six in total. I moderated uh, four or five, participated in two. Um, the, the dialogue was very friendly back then. It was very respectful. It didn't mean that Dawkins believed anything about religion. He, he didn't. But he didn't think that religious people were bad people. He, and he didn't think that religion had nothing to contribute. That's what we're hearing now, that it has nothing to contribute. And that everything, as Christopher just said, is going to one day be open to scientific rational investigation. Really? Does anyone here really believe that? Do you think we will ever truly understand the infinity of the cosmos? We might. But right now there's no reason to believe we ever will. It's too vast. Humans are mortal. And that's an act of faith. That is an act of pure faith. To say that we will one day understand, Christopher Hitchens has just said, he has faith without any evidence that this will one day happen. On the contrary, the more we discover is the infinitesimal nature of man. And science is actually showing us that. And there's so many mysteries. And they may one day unravel and reveal their secrets to the human mind. They may not. Any, anyone here who is, a, who is absolutely atheistic, agnostic, is certain there is no God. You still have many beliefs. You probably believe that the world is going to get better. Why are we all so upset that America is declining? 64% of people in the CBS poll, poll just said that America is in serious decline. Why are you upset? Historical inevitability predicted this. It is inevitable. America will fall, period. You can elect the best president. You can have the best Congress. You can, have, you can root out all political corruption, but history shows as Oxford's greatest historian, who unfortunately was a little bit anti-Semitic, Arnold Toynbee, in the study of history, there, America will fall as every civilization beforehand. So why are we doing all this? Why do we think it's not true, it's not inevitable? And there's no evidence to support any belief that it won't. None. All the evidence says we are doomed. It's happened before. It's called cyclical history and there's no way out. No matter how much you want to identify, read all of Gibbon about how Rome fell, it's still inevitable because human beings are corrupt. And yet we still believe that we can perfect. That's a belief. No evidence whatsoever. In that sense, I think, that, and let me conclude by saying, in that sense I think, that the religious ideas of, the, of linear history, our ability to make tomorrow better than today and give our children better lives than we ourselves had, that is a religious belief and it doesn't make a difference if you don't believe in God, because again it's unsupported by fact. If we were to take a scientific determinist view of life, it's quite, quite gloomy and it's quite, it's quite dark. The reason why I respect Christopher Hitchens amidst our, some of our very serious disagreements, and let me conclude by saying, based on everything that I just said, is that he's different to all the other atheists. Honestly, I've discovered this in debating them. You see, he has a genuine love for humanity. Richard Dawkins will go up and say, I'm going to arrest the Pope because the Pope um, allowed the uh, uh, molesting of children, or as Christopher would call it, raping of children. I think you've used that in many of your essays. Rape and torture. Rape and torture. Okay, fair enough. Richard Dawkins suddenly loves children. He even wrote in his book that, um, that religious parents, I think, should be prosecuted or not prosecuted. They should be stopped from giving their children religious edu education, etc. He suddenly cares about kids. Really? What's he done for kids? You mean only when the Pope comes to Britain he remembers there's kids? But in other words, he doesn't love children, in my opinion. He probably just hates religion. But Christopher Hitchens is very different. He has shown throughout his life an absolute dedication to the human family. He has been one of the most eloquent voices for human rights that there is. That's why I honor him. Because at the end of the day, I don't care what a person believes, I care what they do. And in, that, in this sense, this is a great debate, but it doesn't really matter. Because action is everything. Is a Barack Obama Muslim? He says he's a Christian, I believe him. But what if he were? Who cares? I don't care if he believes in the Starship Enterprise and speaks Klingon. As long as he's a good president, does, you know, if he has values that I can respect, if he stopped the genocide in the Sudan, if he spoke out strongly against a woman who may be stoned to death in Iran, I don't care if he believes in, in, in the rafters of the ceiling. What, what does that bother me? I care what people do. In that sense, I don't care what Christopher Hitchens believes or doesn't believe. He's a champion of human rights, and we need more of them. I, you know, the essays of his that I've read... The essays of his that I've read, there is no 
more eloquent um, assailer of tyrants and dictators than Hitchens. And you're right about the Catholic Church, or at least Pope Pius uh, XII, Eugenio Pacelli, and Hitler, of course. That was uh, a bugaboo in our last debate, so let me concede the point, absolutely. Um, Pius XII, Eugenio Pacelli, uh, I believe, and I'm sorry to say this to all my Catholic brothers and sisters, because they were, they were phenomenal. Pope John XXIII was one of the greatest men of the 20th century, I believe. But Eugenio Pacelli, I believe, was a criminal who never spoke out against the Holocaust even once, who allowed masses to be said when Hitler was, died, and indeed he signed the first concordat with, uh, with the Nazi Third Reich. Um, but his predecessor, Pope Pius XI, gave an encyclical against Hitler in 1937 that was read through all the churches. I think it was called, Brenner, I don't speak German. Someone help me, be Brenner Storge with Mit burning. Brenner, Mit Brenner de Sorge. What, sorry? Mit Brenner de Sorge with mounting anxiety. With mounting anxiety. And then he, of course, wrote the encyclical that was going to publish in 1939 against the discrimination against Jews, which, when he died uh, in mid-1939, was, was squashed by Pius XII. That's the reason why amidst, when I met the Pope, Benedict, I was there for part of a conference as Jewish leaders who wanted to find good in Pius XII, and I had to explain to Cardinal Casper and everyone else that I met that I couldn't do that. You're absolutely right about that. Okay, Religion so has a lot to apologize for, and we should. We absolutely should. So God removed his vicar of Christ on earth in the 1930s from a, an anti-Nazi one to a pro-Nazi one just in time for the advent of the third. That's what you have to believe <laughs> if you're a Catholic. This is the appointed vicar of Christ on earth. The power has the, the, holds the keys of Peter and the apostolic succession. There was one who was very dubious about the Nazis. He gets whacked out <laughs> just in time for one who's soft on Nazism to be the holder of the key. Believe this or believe it not, but it's a point of faith. Okay, so why is tonight different from other nights? <laughs> because it turns out you have a furry, child-friendly atheist in your midst. <laughs> On okay. behalf of the Board of Trustees of This World, the Values Network, I would like to offer our sincere appreciation to visiting adjunct professor Christopher Hitchens <laughs> and And our most courageous moderator, Lisa Haas, for treating us to a fascinating and intriguing dialogue this evening. Also, we want to thank all. Thank you. I'm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, and please forgive me, I may need to run in the midst of your answers to pick up a child, if, oh. okay. you know, but I'll, I'll, I'll move quickly. It's actually one for each of you. Um, Christopher, uh, it, it seems to me that these positions are somewhat dated, or the positioning is somewhat dated, in the sense that many Americans, uh, in particular, tend to pick and choose from different faith traditions or really have m not much patience with religious orthodoxy but pick and choose from different traditions to create an amalgam of a spiritual life and do you have an objection to uh, a life spent in good works um, in which someone may be inspired by aspects of Hinduism or Buddhism or Judaism uh, without being holding any fealty to religious faith um, if their felt perception is that a, a spiritual uh, reality motivates them. And then I have one for you quickly. Okay. Well, I'll ask him quickly and then I may need to scamper mid-answer, but okay. um, the one for you is, I'm perfectly prepared to believe that Jews are great, but if we're so great, why don't we proselytize? Why do we or why don't why we? Why don't we proselytize? Oh. <laughs> okay. All right, well, Thomas Jefferson at one point writes to his nephew, I think it's Peter Carr, saying, there will be a time when every young Amer American of intelligence will be Unitarian. Seems stupid now. The Unitarians are still around. They produce the Jefferson Bible, which is the well-snipped version that takes out the supernatural, leaves you a very short book, <laughs> and, and also snips out the immoral, which makes it even more prunable. Um, and they believe, as you know, in one God maximum. But actually, Jefferson's prediction wasn't that far off. Among students I know from the 
the impression I get of the middle class uh, press and media, the, the general tendency is to a kind of cafeteria a la carte religion selected from some kinds of Eastern cult sometimes, um, from a few of the tenderer bits of the Beatitudes, from some, from some of Maimonides perhaps, and assembled in a pain-free way um, that would fit at the Society for Ethical Culture or other places where they don't sing uh, about it. <laughs> And anodyne as this is, and rather tedious, um, it doesn't, like holy water, it, if it doesn't do you any good, it still doesn't do you all that much harm. <laughs> and it meets my test, really, which is this. Though I do, in fact, know a bit about religion and other people's religions, I sort of have forced myself to find out now what it's been forced upon me. My test is this. I don't want to have to know what your religion is. I live in the United States of America. You can be, have any religion you want as long as you can keep it to yourself. <laughs> but the moment I have to hear about it, <laughs> or you want it taught in my school to my kids, or, in the, or, or produced in the public square with taxpayers' money, or you object to anyone criticizing it, especially if you back that even with the hint of a tiny threat of violence, you have made in me a mortal enemy. And I'll keep my part of that pact if you will keep yours. So by all means, the mush solution, because it's all mush to begin with. I will briefly address just something that Christopher just said. Um, Christopher seems to be saying that religion is harmful at worst and usually, uh, and at best as long as it's um, stripped of any kind of uh, passion, then it should be allowed. Um, one of the greatest living historians, who's British, and I assume Christopher knows him, is the historian Paul Johnson, and he wrote History of the American People. His argument throughout the book, and he's one of the most readable historians, and I got to know him when I was in England, is that America's prosperity actually has to do with its religious zeal. That America, it was not by accident that this nation that was born 230 years ago rose to become the world's greatest power, not in modern times, but in, of all time. The Roman Empire at its height did not field legions in 162 nations, or have uh, I'm not going to go into uh, how they calculate this, but um, based on ancient times, modern times, our GDP by far would outdo the Roman Empire, were brought to modern times. He says it was because of its religious zeal. He, he points out something interesting. He even says, look at the marketing of Coca-Cola. It's the real thing. Manif words like manifest destiny. The argument can be made that because America is a very religious country, in God we trust, and all these things that surround us, uh, one nation under God, that it had this belief in itself, because belief was central to the fabric of the nation. And by and large, America was never guilty of religious wars, of going and slaughtering people in the name of the Christian God, which is predominant here in the United States. Um, on the contrary, there were 80 million born-again Christians in America, and they were largely the political base of George Bush. And they supported wars to remove tyrants, when many people who who were not people of faith, did not support those wars by and large. And you might say till today, I think the war in Iraq was a big mistake. But remember, this was a war to remove a killer, and we didn't fight it well, and we made a lot of mistakes, and too many people died, and too much money was wasted. But we removed this killer. America's not into religious wars. We didn't then say, okay, Iraq's going to be a Christian nation. We're going to have bases there. Let's stop saying that if you have religious zeal and passion, you're going to shove it down people's throats. It's a lie. It's an absolute lie. Not only is it a lie, but it is, it, it, it's character assassination. Because Christopher started this debate by saying that science is based on facts. Now, I want to see the facts about religious people in America who are violent. Just a second. Just a second. Now, to answer Naomi's... Um, and you can bring exceptions, but they prove the rule. America is a peaceful nation that has never had this religious war. Although it is the most religious country in the Western Hemisphere, by far. 
Um, Naomi's question briefly, and she's gone, so Avram, you'll please give her my answer, okay? Uh, why don't we proselytize? You know, this is interesting. I think that one of the things that Christopher Hitchens and other atheists share with religious fundamentalists is a belief in uniformity over true diversity. In other words, Christopher cannot accept that there, anyone should be religious. It's subtitle of his book, How Religion Poisons Everything. Um, Richard Dawkins, as I said, actually believes that religious parents ought to be, he, he wrote either they should be prosecuted or should be denied teaching their children religion. You shouldn't even have freedom of choice in America how you educate your kids. Come on, if that's not an extreme position. Okay, you can clap. You can clap if you believe that we ought to imprison parents for raising their kids the way they want to. You can live in that frickin' world. But let me tell you, I will fight and die before I live in a country that either forces religion on people or forces them not to have religion, okay? And I find it astonishing that people would clap when someone says that religious parents should be prosecuted for teaching their kids religion. So be it. It just, proves my, it just proves my point. The new fundamentalists are often the atheists. They are the ones who are intolerant. The reason why Judaism does not proselytize is because we do not believe in uniformity. We believe that the world is enriched by difference. We don't believe we're right, and you have to be like us to be right. I never told Christopher Hitchens once tonight that he should be a man of faith, or that he's facing God, as we all are. And to use your words on my radio show, to use, to use your words on my radio show, you said that you were faith, I said, um, you, you said, you mentioned to uh, Charlie Rose that you were dying. And you said, um, well, just more rapidly than others. And I hope that it's, God willing, you know, not as rapidly. I hope that you have a long life. In fact, I, I'm going to end this debate with a little gesture uh, to show how important that is to me. But, 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 but Christopher, you know, when you come along and you say that no one, should, everyone should be like you because you're certain that we're, everyone is wrong, that's uniformity. Everyone should be like this. I think a world that is all masculine is insufferable. If it's all feminine, it's insufferable. I actually believe in diversity and difference. There are going to be people who believe, people who don't believe. Religion for so many centuries made the mistake of saying, no, no, if you don't believe, we're going to burn you at the stake because we're right. And now, atheists are telling us, if you're if you actually believe in something, you are a stupid, uneducated, primitive, backwoods, Neanderthal. And we're the smart ones. Come on, if that isn't condescending, then what is? We can live in that world where we just insult each other, abuse each other, put each other down. We can only find the bad in each other. It's been done. I won't do it. If I lose the debate, I won't do it. If I'm, if I'm never invited to speak again, I won't do it. I will not betray myself to be popular. I won't do it. I have beliefs. And my belief is that we have something to learn from each other. I believe it to the core of my being. And that's why Jews don't proselytize. Well, I don't know if I can <coughs> come up to Shmuley's matchless courage in maintaining that there should be two sexes and two genders. <laughs> but I admire him for setting the example of fortitude. That's <laughs> I'll confine myself to the question of whether manifest destiny prevented religious war in the United States, or not. Now, Paul Johnson, who I suspect you of having met at Oxford, by the way. I met him in London. Is, we had um, an amazing whiskey a, together. Uh, is an extreme right-wing Catholic nutbag, actually. Um, <laughs> who I used to know quite well. With some merits as a historian, it's true. A bit of a pot boiler. But if you quote him rightly on this, he's just wrong. Um, until promulgation of the federal constitution, if you were in Maryland and you were not a Catholic, you couldn't hold office. If you were in Massachusetts and you were, you couldn't hold office. If you were in Georgia, you had to affirm the state religion, which was, interestingly enough, Protestantism, not further defined. Jews were subject to disabilities in various states. You go on, as you, everyone knows the story. Uh, of course, the, the, the 13 colonies would have fall, fallen apart, and on a religious basis, too, if it wasn't for the secular work of the two giants of the subject, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, who first brought about the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom. They said, no, we first, we begin by destroying the established church. Every country that ever grows up 
into anything like a mature democracy has to do this. Sometimes it's a process of terrible violence, as in France or Russia. Sometimes it's not so bad as in the English Civil War, but any country seeking maturity has to break the established church. That was easy when it was just the Anglican Episcopalians. It's gone, abolished. Okay, says Virginia, now what? Patrick Henry says, why don't we subsidize instead all churches? That was quite a popular thought. Everyone pays tithes to keep all faiths going. Or only one or two. No, says Jefferson. No, says Madison. We're going to propose something completely new. No one has to support any church of any kind at all. You want a church, build it yourself. This is the first time in history it still is because the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom becomes the basis of the First Amendment to our Constitution. The first time ever that a country has announced itself to be secular where the only mention of God in its Constitution except for the very, very preamble, is, and all of religion is showing how and where it must be and is limited in the public square. Only mentioned in order to be constrained, because they knew its horrible power. Have we been true then to this? Which totally negates Johnson's view. If it, uh, Madison thought you shouldn't even have uh, chaplains in the armed forces. Neither, by the way, do I, not at taxpayers' expense nor opening the prayers of Congress or proceedings every day, flat out unconstitutional. We haven't been true to this document, but it's because of that, not of manifest destiny, that we've been spared religious war. Anyway, we weren't spared religious war. The missionaries went far and wide to convert the Indian tribes. The Indian tribes fought against each other as far away as Oregon, as Catholic and Protestant, egged on by different kinds of missionaries. It speeded the destruction of Native America. The American Civil War, one of the worst wars ever fought, was fought over whether Christianity could or could not justify the continuation of slavery and was, by its great abolisher Lincoln, denounced as a war between two kinds of Christian. William McKinley announcing American expansionism and imperialism in the invasion of the Philippines said, we sent our army and navy to the Philippines to Christianize the Filipinos, who he didn't know, or maybe did, had been Catholic for three centuries. Well, it's an interesting question from a Protestant like McKinley. He may not have thought that they counted as Christian, or he may simply not have known that they're called the Philippines for a reason, that another bloody Christian imperial power had decided to name millions of people after one of its blood-stained Catholic kings. Comes to the same thing. No, not exactly. To say we're exempt from religious warfare in this country is nonsense. And then finally to join the First World War. The, the, the pious Christian Woodrow Wilson takes us into a war. Every contending party in Europe is led by its king emperor, who is head of his local church from Russia to Britain, the most destructive war in human history, and the one that curtain raises fascism, Stalinism, and the era of the totalitarianism. Of totalitarianism. No, let nobody say we've been exempt, but let it be understood that it is our right to be exempt from it. And that every time you hear a religious demagogue open his or her mouth, you have the right to say they're being anti-American. And that their right to do this uh, is in conflict with the law. Not always, but sometimes. Utah was told it couldn't be in the Union unless it gave up plural marriage and, what amounts to the same, incest and rape and trading of children. The selling of daughters to uncles, dirty old uncles as wives. That's what plural marriage really means incest and rape. And it's still carried on with insufficient police attention in some parts of Utah and Nevada to this day, as the Reverend Jeffs can show you. No, we said to the Mormons, you're out of the Union and the army's coming if you want to practice this religion. Of course, certain things should be illegal, especially as they, as they uh, bear upon the child. Is there anyone in this hall who thinks that religion justifies the mutilation of a child's genitals? Is there? Good. Well, wouldn't you like a law that said that non-elective surgery on the private parts of a child should be enacted? Isn't it time? What, what a shunder, what a shame, what a disgrace that we still haven't got this far. We can't prevent, in the name of God, in the name of faith, gentle mutilation in our country. And we complacently sit here as if religion was no threat to us. Huh. You see, what, you see how, what a long job civilization has, uh, taming, uh, taming faith.
and making it finally acceptable to the point where you and I can talk about it this way. But it took a long time. We've no right to forget what religion was like before its fangs were drawn, as I started by saying. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Hitchens and Rabbi Boteach. Uh, you both speak with an eloquence at its highest pitch. I have just two quick, quick, two quick, quick, brave, very brief questions. One for Rabbi Boteach and one for Professor Hitchens. Uh, professor Hitchens is wondering if I could speak to Adjunct you. Adjunct, Professor Hitchens. Excuse me? Adjunct visiting professor. <laughs> thank you. Um, adjunct visiting professor Hitchens. I was wondering if I could speak to you um, after for possibly you would uh, come and speak at Yeshiva University later on. And Rabbi Boteach, in one of Professor Hitchens, or adjunct Professor Hitchens, um, <laughs> adjunct strips, visiting Professor Hitchens, adjunct visiting Professor Hitchens scripts, um, he sardonically refers to the Rambam's quote of Afal Pi Shayit Mamea that, you know, though he may tarry, the, how the Mashiach may tarry, the Messiah may tarry. I was wondering how you would reply or respond or interpret that halacha in, in Sefer Malach. I think, I think we all believe that the perfection of uh, humanity, society, our political system, our economic system, uh, economic inequality is something that tarries. It takes a long darn time and I don't think, and that's what we're speaking about. Messianism is about uh, raising humanity to a more perfect state, society to a more perfect state. Uh, it's a very long drawn out process. You know, I find it astonishing that in the year 2010 only 60 percent of the world's countries are democracies. Uh, we all thought that the end of the uh, Soviet Union would uh, presage the world of democracy, but that's not what's happening. It is, it is a long drawn out process. Let me also just say, uh, when uh, Professor Hitchens, goodbye, Paul. Thank you so much for coming. God bless you. When, uh, when Professor, uh, prof I'm saying it. When, when, when Christopher Hitchens, adjunct visiting professor of God denial studies at our organization, um, <laughs> when he said that about the general mutilation. First of all, I was, I was squirming over here. Uh, I, I'm just hoping I'm not mutilated. Um, you know, he said at the beginning of the of, of the debate that we this discussion debate that we have to follow the evidence. You can't just call it genital mutilation um, when science is now saying that the best way to guarantee the end of the spread of AIDS in Africa is through circumcision and now African countries are trying to get people to circumcise themselves and mutilate themselves so that they stop the spread of AIDS. That is a scientific fact. Um, I didn't make that up. I was even surprised to read it. It's now being practiced all over Africa, trying to get men to circumcise themselves, circumcise their sons, so that AIDS does not spread. Um, female genital mutilation, which makes it, and I, I know, you know, I, I've written a few books about sexuality. Of course, when you remove a woman's clitoris and she can no longer feel sexual pleasure, that's a denial of, of the beauty of sexuality. And sex is a beautiful thing, not for procreation but because of the pleasurable experiences that two people can have that draw them closer and wash them away in a, in a, in a sea of positive emotion that transforms their, their, their relationship. Uh, but, but, but circumcision has not shown that that does that to boys. And there are other studies that would... But the AIDS thing has always impressed me, and I was wondering what Christopher had to say about it. Sure, the spread of AIDS. No, no, there's no, been all no, these no. important studies about it from the World Health Organization. Um, if there are doctors here who know more about it, you should even... It it there are two very, two very simple replies to that. One is from the Rambam Maimonides himself, who says that the point of circumcision is to try and diminish the turbulence of the relevant member um, and to blunt it as far as possible while making it compatible with procreation. That's explicitly given as the reason. It's also why he says it must be done to the child because someone older might be too aware of the pain and discomfort and loss of sensation and not do it. Now, if you want to say, we'll practice this on the people of Africa instead, <laughs> so they'll not get AIDS, well, lots of luck, but that's not what the recommendation is. And any grown person or person of sexual maturity in Africa who wants to do that may do it. But I am not going to say, and I'm shocked to hear anyone appear to disagree, that it would be for me to take an African baby on my knee and remove and strip away its foreskin and prepuce on the off chance it might later be a sexually promiscuous person. This is monstrous. It's like eugenics. It's like genetic engineering. We have no right and we've no right to overlook what the true motive is. Same for male as for female. 
to carry on religion's enduring war against sex. There. By the way, yes, I will come. Yes, I will come and talk at the yeshiva if I'm spared. <laughs> God willing. And if you can. Well, that means we're just going to pray harder. But uh, okay. And if you can raise my price. Hitch, you look great, and keep it up, and we, I think we all agree with the rabbi. We hope you're around for a very long time to come. Thank you very much for tonight. Thank you. <laughs> but but you've, you've, you've warned us not to spare you, and so uh, I, I want to kind of uh, pr press you a little bit on something you said. I'm very interested in hearing the rabbi's opinion as well. You mentioned uh, Eugenio Pacelli, uh, Pope Pius XII, I think everyone's... Uh, familiar with him and so forth. You also mentioned that you just met Benedict XVI, who just landed in uh, Hitch's uh, home country, I guess, earlier today. And uh, Hitch, I've heard you make this point before, uh, and you did it tonight again, where you mentioned that he was a member of Hitler's youth. But isn't, isn't it true that he was mandatorily conscripted into that, that he deserted from the army as soon as he possibly could, that his father and mother opposed the Nazi regime, and that he had actually had a cousin with Down syndrome who was killed by the Nazis. So is it unfair for you to sort of slander him as a um, member of Hitler's youth in light of that? And Rabbi, I'd be very interested in hearing what you think not, of that well. Well, no, it's not, because um, it's, I won't be told by anyone who was a member that my beliefs are National Socialist. That was my original point. Second, in his memoir, which I've read, um, very slender little memoir, he does mention being conscripted into the Nazi army and says you couldn't get away from it. That's what every single German has always said. There was nothing you could do. You had to play along. We have the examples of many, many very brave, including many brave atheist Germans, to give that the lie. Yes, you could get out of it. There were all kinds of ways you could. But let's suppose, for the military service, he wasn't able to. He doesn't happen to mention that he was ever in the Hitler Youth. He didn't come up with the excuse that you had to do that, too, till it was pointed out to him, and by historical archivists, that he had done that as well. Wouldn't you rather it had been the other way around? that he'd first said he'd done it and then said he had to, rather than being found out to have done it and then said he had no choice. And if that's the level of his morality and his compromise with evil, then what's he doing? I don't care about him as an individual. What's he doing giving moral lectures to everybody else? He falls below the average standard of the German uh, citizen, in, who in their majority never voted for the Third Reich, though they were ordered by the Catholic Center Party in the Reichstag to make the monstrous leader of that party into the chancellor of the German Republic. This record is very plain. This record is very plain. The Catholic Church comes before us as an organization that where Nazism is discussed has only just begun to apologize for its role, its disgusting, bemurdered role, and will never be able to apologize enough as long as the memory of that atrocity remains real to us. <laughs> From these people, excuse me, I will take no lectures in morality ever on any terms on any subject. Okay. Enough from that. Can I just say, um, uh, just because we're over time, we're going to go to 9.30, so please don't think this is ad infinitum. Um, six minutes and that'll be it, okay? So let's make the questions much quicker, okay. please. I'll be quick. Hello, Scott. Hi. Hey, Scotty. Brother Schmoley. Hey, Hitch. Um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted, you, said it, you said you're 100% against people forcing religion on people. Correct. Why is it okay for parents to force it on their children? How can you teach children religion without forcing it on them? They have no, they have no scientific defense yet. Um, I'd like to know about that. And uh, as far as the, the, the Pope goes, if the Pope was atheist instead of Catholic, would you still say he's an honorable man, despite the fact that he's, that he's looking the other way on children being tortured? Finally, um, I've been praying to... I've been Scott, praying, I, I said we got six yeah. minutes. One last thing. I've been praying for 25 years to all the gods for WABC to hire a black host. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? Am I kneeling the wrong way or what's going on? Anyway, thank you. Well, now, now the people at WABC, uh, my very dear friend Lori and uh, all the others, now know the Scott Pellegrino who torments WABC, right? Um, but Scott has a lot of good in him. You've got to dig deep. No, I'm kidding. Scott's a very good friend. He comes to our house for shoppers all the time and he torments me, okay? Uh, very quickly, come on, Scott, let's get real. Parents are going to raise their children in their traditions. You're basically saying, don't raise your kids. I'm going to raise you, but I'm going to make sure that I don't subject you to any of my beliefs, any of my values. Let's, let's not be absurd here. 
Um, in the same way that atheists are going to raise their kids with what they believe to be true, that's, that's what upbringing is. And God willing, one day when you have children, and I look forward to bouncing them on my knee, you'll probably do the same thing. You probably won't say, um, little shmooly, because that's what you'll name one of your kids, Scott. Uh, I want you to go to synagogue even though there is no God. Um, you're going to raise them, you know, the way, the way, you, and as far as uh, Benedict uh, uh, the 16th, that's what your question was specifically about Benedict XVI. Right? I want to be very fast. Look, I met the Pope. I was there with a the delegation. They tried to uh, convince us about Pius XII. They showed us documents. I was unconvinced. Um, and I said so, and I remain friendly with them. I agree with Hitchens, uh, with Christopher Hitchens, completely on, on the Catholic churches. But you can't blame the whole church. But yes, it was the leadership, and it was Pius XII. Um, and he should not be beatified. He, be, he should not be uh, canonized. But Pope John XXIII saved so many Jews during the Holocaust was a very outspoken, and he's the one who convened Vatican too. He was a great man. Um, you know, in religion there are great men and there are people who aren't. Should the present pope be against kidney torture? Of course he should, and he should be held accountable, and I'm not excusing that in the slightest. But as far, no, 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 I, I'm not excusing it in the slightest. Let me make that absolutely clear. When religion per per perpetrates atrocities, it must take, must take full responsibility and never whitewash its sins, period, because that violates everything it believes in, and the great sin of the religious is hypocrisy, okay? Um, but let me just say, as far as the Jewish community is concerned, to answer that other questioner uh, in 10 seconds, the Jewish community is grateful to, pa to Benedict XVI for the overtures he's made to the community. He's visited three synagogues and his papacy, which is only, I think, four years old now. That's a rarity among popes, and he's really reached out. And I consider him a friend to the Jewish community, but that is unrelated to everything that happened with children. Thanks for coming, Scott. I think this is our last question. Okay. Oh, hi. Okay. Uh, Christopher, great to see you in person, finally. It's a real honor. Um, Wait, what, what am I, chop liver I'm over sorry, here? No, I'm right now because, listen, my question's for you. Well, am I not here in person? Am so I like no, an apparition or something? No, this, is, this or, uh, is totally with you. Okay. Okay. So, um, all right, not, so not I've to been, be undone. I've been, uh, I, so I'm involved in the erotic arts uh, for some years now. The erotic and, arts? Yes. I got and, an interview for a book, okay. And, um, Did so, they mutilate you as a child? I'm sorry? Were you mutilated no, as I'm a child? No, I'm Jewish. Oh, so they did mutilate you? I guess so, but okay. I still receive sexual pleasure quite. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So my thing is, is that so I, I have like a lot of sensitivity when it comes to when it comes to organizations and groups who are stifling sexual expression in America. Uh, most of them seem to be Christian and Catholic based. Um, I'm assuming if Islam had a greater foothold in America, I'd probably be hearing a lot from them as well. Um, but I don't really hear a lot from Jewish organizations when it comes to uh, stifling sexual expression. And I'm wondering if I'm wrong there, or am I onto something? Jews like sex. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I bet Catholics also like sex. And uh, Lisa Oz is um, a Christian, correct? Yes. Okay. And I, I'm not going to speak for what you like or not. <laughs> it depends who's defining it. I'm, I'm also a member of a cult by someone else's definition, so uh, okay. that's why I hesitate. Oh, okay. I mean, I suppose it's possible to like sex without liking women. <laughs> um, well, in fact, I suppose in theory it must be possible. But, but if you, you see I'm identifying something essentially implausible or, or potentially horrible, what I mean to say is this. When I say religion is man-made, in other words, it shows every sign, of being produced by a primate species that's half a chromosome away from chimpanzee. I don't just mean man-made in that sense. I mean male-made. It, it's very noticeable, especially of the monotheisms, that they are run by and for men and founded by and for men. The Jewish prayer, I don't have to tell you, used to begin. Some, the Orthodox one still does. Thank God for not making me a Jew, a, a Gentile or, or a woman. The, um, I don't need to labor to you what the Quran says about the place of women in religion. And the disabilities laid upon women by Christianity are, again, too, too numerous to mention. It's, it's too obvious that the repression of, of the female is, a, is a, a principle of monotheism uh, for it to be overlooked. Doesn't mean that pleasure can't come from repression. Some people say it can. <laughs> Try anything once. But it's, um, I think it's, a, it's an unhealthy thing, surely. And isn't it rather noticeable that the, uh, in debates even in this city on, for example, the rights of uh, homosexuals, that Orthodox Jewry at least seems to take it as a particularly strong responsibility 
to oppose any manifestation of gay life. I don't know why that should be or what its scriptural authority for that is. I suppose it's probably Leviticus, as with Christianity. Well, I, I'm an but it's, but it, it's something you can't not notice if you're interested in the subject. I'm an Orthodox rabbi. This morning I was on Rosie O'Donnell's uh, radio show, organized by Terry Caden, who was That's one of the That's going too far. <laughs> 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 and uh, I have a gay Orthodox Jewish brother uh, who's Orthodox. And... Um, and um, I don't see that homosexuality is a huge issue. In other words, I know what the Bible says, but I always say to my brother, the Torah consists of 613 commandments. You have 611 that you want to keep. Okay, <laughs> that'll keep you busy. Uh, I don't see it as some great emphasis that we put. On the contrary, I, 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 the Bible says that it's not good for man to be alone. Uh, are you, you know, sometimes your faith and your humanity, you, you feel in conflict. You do, and, and as you see gay men and women who love each other and who are not alone and then you know that oh the bible says x y and z about it it's not an open and shut case that we simply say religion says that you can't be with this person and you have to be alone i believe in grappling with our faith and it's 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 not so simple and i think those who make it simple are those who are fundamentalists um, and that's the problem but to say that religion has nothing to say about relationships between people or that women are always subordinate and everything else. I mean, the Talmud that I study tells me I have to respect my wife more than me. The Talmud that I study says, uh, the Bible that I read says that when, when Abraham had a dispute with Sarah, God said, you must listen to everything that Sarah tells you. And Jews have always seen her as a greater prophet than Abraham, and he's the father of our faith. Um, there are so many examples of men being, in fact, in fact the Bible, our, our Torah says that women are, are, are wiser than men. And I've seen that with my mother, I've seen that with my wife. The definition of, uh, you know, the, the Jewish aphorism says the wise man and the clever man. The clever man can extricate himself from situations to which the wise man would never have gotten himself into. And I, had I listened to my wife about half the things I did in my life that were controversial, controversial or self-serving or just downright stupid, uh, I wouldn't have made mistakes. Uh, she was the wise person. So I don't see that women are, are, are necessarily subordinated. And to the extent that certain things need to be adjusted in religion, uh, Christopher, that's why I welcome your criticisms. Um, again, it comes down to, and this is the final thing I'm going to say, is that well. whether religion poisons everything. I think we all have something to learn from each other. And Thank you again for attending tonight's thank event, you. and we wish you a good evening. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please give me uh, 30 seconds. Uh, we have a gift for Christopher Hitchens. Oh my God. Uh, Philip Stein is one of the world's finest watches, but they produce a watch the that has become the symbol of our Turn Friday Night into Family Night campaign. Maybe this is something, Christopher, that you might agree religion gave that is a good thing. Friday nights, we simply have dinner with our families without television, without the internet, without noise, and we try to focus on our kids. So this is a global initiative that we have. Uh, Dr. Mehmet Oz is a patron. Um, uh, Gail King, Dr. Phil, and I was hoping that Christopher would agree to be one of the patrons as well. It's simply two uninterrupted hours for atheists and religious people alike <laughs> to give to their kids. And you are a very loving father. You have three children. We talked about them at dinner. So this is this beautiful watch. It's a gift from the Philip Stein Corporation. I hope that you really enjoy it. Well, thank you. Thank you. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, if you would all just join me, it is our hope, whatever you believe or don't believe, that you will just join us in a small toast. It's the night before Yom Kippur, uh, Judaism's holiest day. And I wanted to just toast uh, for Christopher's health and well-being, the, the famous Jewish toast L'chaim, which is life. So, uh, okay. It's, it's amazingly nice of you, and thank you. First, for reminder of the passage of time. I mean it. <laughs> and second, for this very handsome gift, and, and a tip for everyone, you turn the bottle, not the cork, okay? Like this, and then. <laughs> and then you say, to life, in any language. Shalom, thank you.